Robert, thanks. This was, you know, we've had what, 50 or 60 talks, maybe a little few more. This was one of our, I can say unconditionally, one of our most inspiring and, and uh, beautiful talks. Thanks, Thank thanks for making it happen. I mean, I, I think we should have another round of applause for Robert. I mean, just, you, just, just the whole process, um, I mean, it's, it's amazing and overwhelming in that sense. And thanks for sharing it so beautifully with us. Um, so what makes an American 22-year-old come to India, leaving his life and family behind and making a life here? So the first three days, I thought this is the biggest mistake of my life. Right? But then after that, I, I got over that. Um, no, so I, I came to Bombay in 2006. Uh, with, I, was, I was coming with two friends from Virginia Tech. I stayed with them, Tane and Malund. Um, and I just loved it. I was there for two weeks. I went back to Virginia Tech and said, I want to work in Bombay. That's it. Uh, eventually, I found uh, RMA. I wrote to Rahul. I said, Rahul, I'm going to work with you. And he said, you're nuts. Um, let's try it for six months. And then if it works, we'll continue. I said, OK, fair enough. And here we are. So that's the very short story. My grandmother asked me how long, so every year I would say, let's try one more year. And then after five years, she gave up. She quit asking. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey with RMA and how that panned out. How's that, how's, that, how's that been? Well, after I joined, I think it was maybe three or four months, six people left. And everyone blamed me. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it was great, actually, because very early on, I got a lot of responsibility. And one of the projects I started on was, um, was a project in Jaipur, where nobody spoke English. And for some reason, Rahul put me on that. And it was great, because it just it forced me to, to really dive into sight, um, which is where architecture happens, right? Drawings are, are one portion. But then seeing those drawings realized is a whole other task. Um, so I was really, really grateful early on to have that experience. And then it just it continued. And we, we kept getting interesting projects. And Rahul and I, like, like, we get along like brothers working together. And it's just been fun. So yeah. <laughs> and where did your, <coughs> where did this journey start? I mean, I know a little bit about it. but. You know, you going down to bookstores or street street bookstores, yeah. and where did that and where did this interest interest in, in Mumbai's history and Bombay's history start? Yeah. So I mean, I love history, especially sanitation history. I've just fallen in love with it recently. Um, so no, I've I've always been drawn to old books. So I was quite in my first few years in Bombay. I would walk the streets every weekend. Um, and I was just enamored by these bookstalls, just hundreds of books scattered. Um, and, you know, I would find things, I would find gems. Uh, I once found a 1964 development plan for Bombay. And this was all before any idea of a book. This was just, I just loved it. And I kept collecting. And then the Arthur Crawford thing happened. And this kind of switch went off. Like, there might be more. And then at 200, I stopped. <laughs> and there are many more, many, many more. Um, so, yeah, and unfortunately, the, the, the booksellers are less now. They're, they're, they're uh, much fewer than they were 10, 15 years ago. But still, they're there, especially floor fountain area. Yeah. And when you see an old book on Bombay, do you s just say, I'm going to buy it? Or do you, do you <laughs> sift through and decide? Or no. I, My wife should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Nine, nine out of ten times I do buy it, yes. Yeah. Nine That's and a half nice. out of ten. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, researching. I, I, when we spoke on the phone, you also talked about, you know, libraries and connecting with libraries all over the world. What was that like? And, and how did that, how did you find a lot of this information apart from, you know, actually f having the book yourself? Or Yeah. This was the fun part. Actually, writing was was immensely enjoyable, but that was a whole different context with the chaos of the pandemic, 
writing was like a, a kind of therapeutic experience. The research was really fun, but also really challenging because like I had a job, right, a day job. So from 9.30 to 7, I was at RMA. I could not, I could not go just walk into libraries during working hours and browse. Um, so I realized early on that this world catalog is fabulous for identifying books and where they're at. And I also realized librarians are generally very helpful. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, whether it was Reba or um, the Welcome Collection in London or libraries in the US, um, they were just really helpful and they would scan and send material. And that's why that Asiatic library thing was so tricky because even though it was down the street, that was the hardest place to get material from because one, I had to escape from office, which was had its own challenges. And Asiatic's great, but it's also just a very challenging place. Like there are so many, you know, for a good reason, there are just a lot of rules and when you can come, what you can do. Um, so it took me like four months to get the Xeroxes of that, <laughs> of that book, um, uh, a New Bombay. So challenges, but also really fun. The highlight though, I would say, is the Maharashtra State Archives. Has anyone here been to the State Archives in, in uh, Bombay? Yeah, one person, right. you're all missing out. Huh? You must go. It's, um, it's just, it's, it's incredible what they have. Um, and it's all available. Like you can just, you can find a file, request it, the file comes to you. And you're in the middle of correspondence that two individuals had 150, 200 years ago. George, Whit George Whitted is shouting at John Begg that you know he doesn't want to change his competition design for the Prince of Wales Museum. John Begg saying it's you know it's miserable. It doesn't look like a museum. Like that's amazing to me. Um, so yeah, so much fun, um, and, and I hope that carried into the the book as well. Mm -hmm. I'm also glad you mentioned the writing because I was reading uh, some of some of the chapters and it's funny, it's interesting, it's got anecdotes and the question here is where did you find those anecdotes? Some of those are impo I mean I how would you find them? Yeah. So the the research phase the it's it's not it's just it's it's um random. So the research phase so I'm working 9 to 7, right? The like hardcore research happened in a local train. And I say this in the, the, my, my bio thing in the book, that it happened in the meditative depths of the Mumbai local. Um, s some of you will have had experience, right, with Mumbai local trains. I actually, I don't like that it takes away from family time and I spend two and a half hours a day traveling, but it is the most peaceful place in Bombay, actually, to think. Um, because I knew when I got in at Churchgate, I'm going to Bandra, I knew I have, 30, 35 minutes, no, no honking, no one bothering me, no one asking me questions. So I would, I, I'll have to stand up to describe this. So I would like, you know, I'm getting down at Bandra, right? So I get out on this side, the door's here. So I would stand like this with my research and I would just read. <laughs> and I'd flip a page and read. And I do that for 35 minutes and it was blissful. And then I, that was like three, four years straight. Um, and you find things that way that, you know, I wasn't searching like I wish he said something crazy to him about that, you know, wild drainage plan. No, you just find things and then I would make notes and come back to it. Now the problem with that was I did so much research, it became overwhelming. And I actually gave up for, it must have been two years, um, I gave up and I said, this, this book will never happen. I even offered to give all my research to a publisher at one point. And fortunately, he wasn't like, in, he wasn't clear in the head, so he just <laughs> didn't even answer. Um, but I gave up and, and Tina said, she said, I said like, this will never happen. Because it was annoying, right? We're in Bombay, we have a, a wardrobe, a really small wardrobe. It's half full of books and this huge manuscript. Like, that's like precious real estate. So I was like, should just get rid of it. It's useless, it's taking up so much space. And Tina said, no, she said, one day at the right time it will happen. Now, general rule, Tina's always right, right? <laughs> um, that's general rule, 99%. 99.9% All wives are always right. <laughs> <Yeah. to me. laughs> so 
But I was really grateful she said that because I had fully given up and then the pandemic hit. I found Amitabha's writing and I just got inspired. Um, and, and really, Amitabha gave me uh, this imagination that you can write clearly, you can be really creative, you can be humorous, you can have fun, and it doesn't have to be long. And that was a breakthrough for me because all the architecture and books I knew on the city previously were just, even if they weren't big books, the text was enormous and it was like relentless. And I realized you don't have to do that. So I didn't, yeah. And then all the research just compressed. And even if I had 10 quotes from the train, I would take two, the two powerful ones and put them in. So yeah. But I, I, it was a lot of fun, the train research, yeah. You know, when you, um, I was looking at your book recently, and, and when you mentioned Chekhov and the, and the six things that he talks about, and actually I wrote something, mm. so I'm just going to read it out. Yeah. And this, was a, this was an observation that I had uh, while looking at your book. So I've written, the book is radically simple. There are no grand statements, no trophy essays. There are no painful laments and hand-wringing of what could have been. It is essentially a record of proposals. So was that always the plan? Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, the thing is, there was never a plan. So once there was, that was it. And it was very clear. Um, I mean, when I, when I went through the book in detail, I was surprised at its simplicity. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, there is nobody writing an essay or nobody yeah. saying something. You're not crying about any yeah. spilt milk or yeah. opportunities lost. Uh, um, okay. And, and that's, but that's because I think like every, every story, there'll be some moment in it where it like, it hits you. Someone said something or they felt something or like the back base scheme not, hap not being profit making until 2015. Like when you have moments like this, why, why do we need to add anything? Like the history speaks for itself, the, the, the characters speak for themselves. Um, so I really tried to just kind of take a back seat, let them do what they did. Cause they, I think what also came out to me is these are all people, right? We often in, the, in all the grand plans, we forget the people behind them. So I've tried to bring the people and the emotions, and that was, that was part of that shift from the serious and scholarly to playful and artistic. It's this kind of constantly fluctuating, uh, but always coming back to the people if I could, yeah. If there was one project in the book which you wish was realized, what would it be? I, I change my answer every week, so if, if anyone has heard me answer this before, forgive me. Um, no, I would have loved Hector Tulek's Underground Railway to have happened in 1869, half of it. So one half, he said, from Jacob Circle, today Satrasta, from there to Fort and Underground Railway, right? I think public transport um, is, uh, it's just, it's so desperately needed. The fact that I have to stand like this and read, it's like, it's not good, right? Um, I can, I make at, it good. At least, at least you're self-supported, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, I wish because I think if if that underground railway plan had happened, it would have it would have created more, you know, other other underground schemes in Bombay would have followed, much like New York, London, around the same time they were, you know, in their seminal stages. Um, but the other half, I'm glad didn't. He said the same train should take uh, human feces out of Fort at night. So that I think would have been weird. Yeah, half of it. But do you think the underground would have worked even with the water with the water table and all that? Tulek said so. He said there's no engineering challenge in Bombay that can't be solved. We'll find out, right? Metro's coming up. It's almost done a few years. <laughs> yeah. And which project are you really glad that never happened? Oh, there are many. There are many. I, I think, you know, the first time I went to Banganga Tank, I was overwhelmed. It was, it's like, you, you leave 21st century Bombay and, and you're like, you're, you know, a thousand years uh, in the past. Um, so the government of Bombay's plan to fill Banganga and make it a children's park, as much as I love children, I'm glad they can't play there. Yeah. 
So tell us a little bit about your aerial photography, the, those pictures. Uh, and you've done an exhibition of that before. You've, I don't know if you have a book. Do you have a book on no. photographs of Bombay? But no. So um, those of you who don't know, yeah. um, Robert, um, f many years ago I, I um, was in, in at, at Fort and I, um, Sabya Sachi Gallery, I think there's a below Sabya Sachi, yeah. above him, above there was this gallery and we were walking around and I went in there. I knew who Robert was. I didn't know that he also did aerial photography. And um, I saw this beautiful exhibition of his photographs. And I thought uh, they were taken from some kind of special plane, some kind of hang glider. <laughs> so I won't spoil the fun. Just tell us how you do it. Yeah, so, um, so I just, you know, whenever I fly, because we have a lot of work outside Bombay, and, you know, of course, Indigo, Spice, Jet, Jet Airways, I used to fly a lot. Um, and I would just be drawn to the window seat because I love looking at cities. Like I love researching the past, but I also love like actually looking at cities. So I just started taking photographs and like the person sitting next to me would be like a little nervous. Like, you know, why is this, this, this foreign guy taking all these photos? Um, but that's okay. Um, and like, again, it was kind of like the book. Like I just, I was just doing it cause I enjoyed it. And I put one image on Facebook one day and Radhi Padik, who runs the gallery you went to, she said, oh, you must exhibit, she wrote to me. And I said, you know, what nonsense, like, I'm not an artist, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just an architect. She said, no, no, you should exhibit. So then we did that exhibition, which you saw. And it was really encouraging because, um, yeah, she just, she said, like, these images are powerful and they need to be seen. So then we just kept doing it. And we did South Bombay, North Bombay, Ahmedabad, Chennai. Basically, wherever RMA's projects went, I would go and, uh, and photograph. So yeah, that's it. But I, I, now the problem is our son is six, and he has a mind of his own. And he also wants the window seat. So we have the fiercest uh, battles in the plane. And Tina's like, you know, like I'm tired of having two kids. So we are just badgering each other for the window seat now. Yeah. So what's next? Um, <laughs> complicated question. Um, so before Bombay Imagined, I actually finished a book called Ahmedabad Walls, uh, a circumambulation with Patrick Geddes. And it's because of that book's failure that we self-published this. So I had a, it, the full book is done, Ahmedabad Walls. Um, and I, I walk around the 600-year-old city walls of Ahmedabad uh, with Patrick Geddes. Patrick Geddes made that Bandra Gateway proposal. Um, like Witted, he visited Ahmedabad. He walked around the city walls. And Geddes made this really strong, passionate argument how to deal with the walls. Should you demolish them? Should we keep them? Should we kind of take a middle ground? So, so I journey with Geddes around the city, write about it have photographs, have aerial photographs. Tina's done a whole photo essay on the city walls today. We finished the book, went to three or four publishers, and they were all like, like, sorry, boss, this is too niche, nothing going. So I just a little bit got fed up, and I said, fine. <laughs> Whatever we do, we're going to just do it ourselves. Um, and then the Bombay idea started, and I just for some reason ran with this. The problem now is the writing in Bombay Imagined is better than the writing in Ahmedabad Walls. So I'm going to spend the next few years, three, four, five years, rewriting that book. And then we'll hopefully self-publish again. But that's next. Yeah. Wow. Questions? Any questions from the audience? Uh, you showed us some slides uh, of the public critique for some of the projects. Uh, which were there. Yeah. How would you compare it to the public critique to public projects today uh, or, you know, throughout the ages? So, like, much in the same way, you see ideas in Bombay getting recycled, right? The Kaneri Reservoir, Dahisa Lake. It's the exact same plan 100 years apart. Um, similarly, people's critiques of the city is it also follows the same kind of recycling um, uh, pattern and so like the first back bay reclamation some you know residents say you're you're destroying the sacred beauty of back bay right you look at the coastal road today 
residents saying the same thing. It's so beautiful. How can we do this to nature? Now, the ironic thing of that argument is the ground they're standing on has also been reclaimed. So they're actually praising a reclamation space, which is doing the same thing they're critiquing. It gets a little complicated. Um, but more or less, it's this cyclic recycling of, of uh, criticisms and praise also, um, just different people. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Robert. Hi. How are you? <laughs> so have you uh, also looked after any contemporary projects which I imagined and which didn't happen? Yeah. Like, are you planning a part two or something like that? No, just so I, I don't know why I did this, but the talk doesn't have much. This talk didn't have much about contemporary projects, but there's a fair amount in the book. Um, I think just because I, okay. I, I love the past so much, I kind of right. I, I lean to that, uh, you know, <coughs> that era, um, you know, pre-2000s. Pre but there must be 25 or 30 projects. There's a 700-meter skyscraper by Norman Foster oh. um, just off Marine Drive. Crazy height. I mean, it's it's it that hits the, the troposphere. Actually, if anyone here knows that type of like, it's you know, it's insane. Um, Oma. There's a project by Oma Heatherwick Studio. Um, so a lot of lot of contemporary projects uh, in the book. Great. No Thanks. phase. No part two plan. Tagia. Igdam tagia. Yes. Um. Have you uh, got any response uh, from, like, have you presented this to the public authorities? And uh, got Not any at reaction? All. Not at all. Would you I, was, I was worried, or I wasn't worried, but a couple of people <laughs> put it in my mind. That if you even take this to Aditya Thakre or Dav Thakre, they'll say, Bombay Q, Mumbai imagined you should write. So I'm a little nervous. I didn't, that's why I didn't push it. But um, I know. Aditya Thakare received the book because uh, a group by the name of Mumbai First gifted it to him. Um, so let's see. I, I, I've not pushed it. Uh, I hope they enjoy it, though, because it's meant to be enjoyable. Yeah. Hi. Um, just a while ago, you spoke about contemporary projects. Yeah. Um, much in the same manner, do you um, have you come across any um, yesteryear project which, uh, when it was developed, uh, it uh, turned out to be uh, forward-looking and it did see the light of the day? Um, can you give any instances of such projects? Great question. Um, so yes, but I don't think I can recall offhand because I had this bias, right? When I was researching, if it happened, I would, I would not uh, zoom in on it. Um, I do recall seeing an eye hospital design in Bombay. Uh, I forget the name offhand. It was, uh, it's an English word, I would opum talek something. Um, beautiful building. I saw the original hand drawing at the state archives again. Um, and it was built. And I, I remember thinking like, wow, like, a dedicated eye hospital in the 1860s, 1870s. Like, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, but I, I, I left it at that. But it was very vivid, the drawing, in my mind. Yeah. I think there's a question here. Yeah. So first of all, I absolutely loved your presentation. Uh, let's fast forward. I mean, uh, you've seen the city. You almost have an Indian accent now, uh, Mumbai accent. Uh, I've lived in Mumbai. And I've made the shift to come to Pune because I just couldn't take the city. Uh, I'm right there with you. <laughs> so, so is there is there uh, in your mind a wild imagination? Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of plans to have CBZs coming up in uh, Oshiwara in BKC. Those didn't materialize. Uh, can we have modular constructs or adjuncts to the city, which will combine home and offices together and take away this uh, long 60 kilometer corridor which goes nowhere. So a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I had hoped the pandemic would do that. <laughs> and it did for a bit, of course. Um, and in many, I mean, you know, I'm in Bandra going to Fort. It's by Bombay standards, not a crazy journey at all. Like it's humane. But it's still two hours a day. And I absolutely 
as hard as the pandemic was, and I, I, I tread cautiously because I know a lot of people really struggled during that time uh, with mental health, but I loved it because like I just I was centered, right? I wasn't I wasn't hustling. Uh, Tina recently used this word. I loved it. Like I wasn't hustling every day, rushing across the city, and it gave me time to think. And I think that happened for a lot of people. So my I had hoped that would change things. Um, unfortunately, from the last two, three months, what I've seen in the trains, it doesn't appear so. Um, and why that is, I don't know. Um, and I fear if, the, if something as crazy and all-encompassing as the pandemic can't change it, I don't, I'm not hopeful anything else can. Um, so I'm, I'm, not to say I'm a dooms, doomsday person on Bombay, but it is a miserable place, right? Charles Correa said it's a, a great city, terrible place. I, I believe I got that right. Um, you know, it is, it's just, it's terrible in many ways. Um, and that was also part of the reason why I enjoyed the book so much, because I found it hopeful, Tina found it a little bit depressing that you had all this, this opportunities of hope that were just missed um, not all of them, of course, are, are you know were necessarily good, but many were, and I, on the other hand, just found it like inspiring uh, that people keep thinking, they keep having these dreams, even in spite of the city being so deficient in front of them in almost every way possible: water, drainage, architecture, transport, cemeteries. Like, you know, it's like it's everywhere lacking, but people are still thinking so. Um, I think it would be a little bit s similar situation with the pandemic and work from home and this kind of up and down journey. Any more questions? You all have been a fabulous audience. I think there's one at the back. I was telling Kushuru on the way here, I was really worried no one would show up. So thanks for everyone. Thanks for coming. Hi. Uh, Hi. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. I just uh, have one uh, um, observation or uh, a suggestion. Yes, sir. Pune is also steeped in history. Yes. We are sitting in an auditorium which is next to uh, Bori. I mean, it's in the campus of Bori. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole state is of uh, institutions. So any uh, thoughts of writing a book on Pune? Oh, man. I, you know, when we came here, I like because the experience of producing Bombay Imagine in the workshop, like the energy of a press and a printing space and a place where books are made is incredible. And to think this hall where we're sitting was right, it's a it's a press. Uh, I was just floored, like I'm so grateful. I mean of course I'm grateful Kushru for inviting here and all the work he did and the posters and the invites and just everything, but I'm really grateful for this event here because it's like sitting in a space where books have been made super special um, so i would love to i don't know if i can write a book but i would love to to do something you know smaller scale but about this space and perhaps the campus at large but specifically this space i think it's thank it's, you uh, very exciting thank you uh, all the planners who have looked at bombay and offered various solutions i find uh, bombay stands out as against other cities which are on the water, as a city which is particularly not wanting to engage with water at all. Everybody looks at the water as something to keep away and to reclaim. Uh, did you ever come across any planner who looked at the water as a positive element instead of something to just... Yeah, totally, totally. Um, I mean, you know, actually, all of the... It's a really nice question. All of the, almost all of the drainage schemes deal with this question. Um, because part of like contemporary Bombay, the sea is, it stinks, right? Because we pump raw sewage into the ocean and just, you know, we're surrounded by our own shit. Um, so like Envy Modoc in the 30s makes this huge complex at, uh, also at Mahalakshmi, same site as Crawford's Park, primary, secondary, tertiary, tertiary sewage treatment. He says by the time the sewage water is discharged into the ocean, you know, it's 
it's uh, not offensive, it's not harmful to any kind of uh, biodiversity. Um, so you have one aspect is just safeguarding the water, right, which is sanitation. Big failure. We are a disaster on that front. Um, then you have, of course, the schemes that are more recreational, correct? Um, so uh, a number of plans uh, at Chaupati Beach, uh, which meant to just kind of beautify and, and organize how Chaupati is managed between hawkers and people. Um, you also have uh, this uh, more contemporary, there's a, a firm called Allen, or AJA, Abraham John Architects, led by Alan and Anka. And they've done a lot of work uh, that deals with the threshold, especially at Juhu, between you know the ocean, the beach, the, the park, inland park that's at the Juhu Aerodrome. So there are a number. Um, but the, the problem with these is they're recreational, right? They're not income generating schemes and those just always lose out to anything like reclamation that has potential to, to generate income. Water transportation, no, not in the book, not water transportation in the book. There are a number of, there's of course bridges, you know, uh, but that's always across the water from South Bombay to the mainland, New Bombay. Um, there were a couple of plans for, there was one plan for an underground, uh, for cars, but an, sorry, underwater tube that you could drive through. That was quite, uh, quite radical. It's in, in the chapter on the Uran Bridge. Um, Number of bridges through waters, yeah. No, not in the book. There have even now there are a number of plans uh, that go from you know Kandivli, Bordivli, uh, but they just you know they announce it. One boat will go, they'll inaugurate it. Someone prime minister will come. A week later, the boat's broken down or something. So uh, it's a little complicated and messy, but yeah. Robert, thanks so much for being here. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard. And once again, thanks to, to all of you for coming. It's wonderful to see you all after so many, so many months, two, two and a half years. And we'll hopefully be doing more of these with the support of ASA and together. And so great. Thank you. <laughs>